Hello everybody, this is Manu S and welcome to another Eternal Top Decks video series. Um, today with Skycrack deck wins. So it's finally time to unveil my Skycrack take that has been doing really well for me on ladder so far. Um, currently I have a bunch of like um, un unrecorded, untracked games and 90 track games so far. Like I usually just play a deck a bunch uh, without tracking stats just to get a rough feel for it, see if it's worth pursuing and once it turns out to be um, promising then I start tracking and I have currently 90 track games for various versions of this deck including the current version and I'm currently at 70% win rate 63.27 which is a pretty above average win rate I would say over 90 games since that's already quite a sample size where um, some variance um, levels out and you get a better idea of how the deck performs. So this deck currently seems to be potentially stronger than the old king of the hill on ladder basically in Cheetolis. It also feels more powerful and more robust. <laughs> but let's dive right in. So let's talk about the four ops first, because these are like the very obvious choices in my opinion. For Flame Blast, the best and most flexible burn spell, like big burn spell, aside from Torch, since it allows you to um, deal maximum damage if you draw a couple of extra power. It is very adjustable to what else you're doing uh, in a turn. It also can be used before turn 5, unlike Obliterate, like on turn 4 you can kill a Seraph or a, stones, uh, a Statuary Maiden and stuff like that. It's just very versatile and the uh, triple fire is not that hard to achieve uh, for this particular deck and the way it is built. So uh, for Flame Blast, easy inclusion. Then we have the one drops for Oni Ronin, for Pyronite, for Snowcrust Yeti. These are all premium. Oni Ronin doesn't need much explanation, it's just one of the best um, aggressive one drops in the game. Warcry is really powerful, especially if you add additional Warcry triggers to it, like this deck. Pyronite, nice synergy with weapons and combat tricks, and stays relevant later in the game. Great flood protection. Uh, has come up quite a bunch even in this deck with 25 power. Um, I frequently ultimate my Pyronites and win games that way. And last but not least, the new all-star Snowcrust Yeti, which is particularly nice with weapons like Scepter and Morningstar. I'll get to the Morningstar in a bit. And also Warcry triggers, like once this guy starts getting a bunch of Warcry triggers, he becomes a really nice threat, especially against more controlling decks with Reapers. So um, this is arguably the best Warcry target among the one drops because the Aegis then really pulls its weight. Uh, removal, we have 4 Permafrost and 4 Torch. I also don't think there's much to explain here. Permafrost is just a one power answer for almost everything. Basically anything that doesn't have Endurance and is just so efficient, such a tempo blowout, so flexible. It's exactly what, a rem what an aggressive deck like this wants and one of the things that I think puts Skycrack ahead of uh, Stonescar. And Torch is just Torch, the universal undercasted all-star of fire and one of the best cards in the game. Next we have the two drops for Champion of Fury. That card is just a furious monster. This is just an incredibly powerful two drop and part of what makes this deck really powerful and another card that puts it ahead of Stonescar since this champion is arguably so much better than Champion of Chaos. <coughs> Being able to hit for 3 to 4 on turn 2 often is really powerful. This is also a really great Warcry target, um, making it a very scary threat later in the game. <coughs> a really nice way to um, regain momentum after a sweeper if it gets to that and all that stuff. And next we have Rakano Outlaw. The other premium 2 drop additional Warcry triggers, like I mentioned good target for combat tricks and the weapons, 
but also uh, synergizes well with the instant speed burn spells like Torch and Rock Slide. Um, usually, if you have the choice between Champion and Outlaw on turn 2, always play Outlaw because of the Warcry right triggers. So you can play Champion a turn later, you give up like 1 damage in total, that way potentially most of the time, but you get a Warcry right trigger which is usually worth much more. Next we have Shogun Scepter, finally a deck in which Shogun Scepter is great. Like the card always was kind of good, but didn't really perform that well in a lot of decks. Like in Rakano it was a bit odd, because the deck was not quite aggressive enough. The double fire had some tension with the double justice from <coughs> Enforcer and stuff like that. And the deck didn't have enough Aegis, and it's also not that great on a familiar and also kind of weird because they both cost 3 so you can't curve familiar into this properly and so on and yeah so Scepter was a bit in an awkward spot before but this deck is like perfect for it. All the units like Snowcrust Yeti is a great Scepter carrier against control. Um, champion is just generally a good carrier and also allows Champion to trade with Titan. Outlaw is a great carrier against smaller units, and Vadius is just like the perfect carrier. Aegis, quick draw, 3 attack, makes it attack into anything that isn't Sandstorm Titan, basically. <laughs> and that brings me to the next card, the another star of the archetype, Vadius Clan Fader, a uh, Clan Fader. 3-2 uh, Aegis, quick draw for 3, great stats, ultimate comes up occasionally, even in a 25 power deck. So in the drawn out grindier games this card can uh, easily win you the game um, in the late game. I just yesterday had a game against Chalice where the guy didn't draw a Chalice or a Harsh Rule, just like a bunch of dudes and interaction. And I had two Vadius and eventually hit my 7th power, ultimated bows and won the race against his great parliament and forced him to like jump block away his board and then win the, tur uh, win the race one turn before his owl, owls could kill me by killing one of his owls. Um, so yeah, really impressive card, also really great warcry target, really great weapon target, synergizes with combat tricks and cheap burn like torch and rock slide to finish off blockers. Really really annoying for the opponent to get rid of if they don't have relic weapons. Um, and another card that I think uh, puts Skycrack ahead of um, the sort of clunkier and less resilient Stone Scar. Now on to the cards that are not auto falls. Um We have two Char Chain Flail. I think these are kind of stock for me by now. Simply because they synergize really well with the 12 Warcry cards. Are uh, also very uh, modular in their cost and size. So they can be used early for tempo, like you, I sometimes go like one drop and flail their one drop on turn two, for example, to gain tempo. Um, they can deal with opposing relic weapons, they can be nice finishers against control decks that have no board. They uh, become even more powerful and efficient with Warcry, sometimes you get a couple of Warcry triggers and can play it for one or two and still <coughs> hit something big while deploying a threat. It's really great, and it's a great way to deal with Aegis. Like, this card is particularly great in the mirror. There's Snowcrust Yetis and Vadius, especially Vadius. This is a really great way to deal with Vadius, which is really annoying in the mirror. The card is very obnoxious, and having a clean answer for that is great. It's also a clean answer for Silverwing Familiar against um, Recano, and a clean answer for Bethalo against Argentport. So, this card is just an all star, basically, and covers a bunch of bases of the deck and is another flexible answer and tempo tool. Um, since if push comes to shove uh, to shove and you have no um, Warcry trigger on it and facing down like a Titan, I had games where I just dropped this on 6 power and killed the Titan to keep attack, uh, to uh, get attacking again and win games that way. Card is just very flexible and nice to have has been doing really good work for me. I can sometimes even see more than two, like a third, if there's enough of the cards that I mentioned that you <coughs> need to kill 
and also because it's so good with the Warcry. Um, next we have Pummel. <coughs> this card is a bit underwhelming, and I'm not the biggest fan of the card. The fact that it only works on attacking is a pretty big letdown, and the fact that it only gives plus two plus two is as well, which means it's usually much worse on one drops, and only is really interesting on like the two drops and Vadius, which is only 12 units, or units with Warcry, which are a couple extra units. But I found it is a necessary evil, mainly because of the card Cathan and to some extent the card Champion of Glory, since both of these are not permafrostable, so the only answer on curve usually is Torch, and you only have 4 Torch. So if you don't have a Torch, um, a 1-3 or a 3-3 Champion of Glory or a Cathan can really, really uh, stall you out very early, which is the death of an aggro deck like this, and Pummel is a great way to stop that. Pummel is like, gives you additional ways to deal with that. Um, it might be that 2 is fine enough, but I feel like 3 is a good number since you really, really can't afford to get stalled out early. And the card is like, <coughs> especially early on, still a nice tempo boost and versatile. Like, if a temple scribe blocks a pyronite, you can still just pummel them, pummel the pyronite, deal 3 damage to them, drop another 1 drop, for example. Um, there's a bunch of things that does. But the thing that makes it necessary basically is Kasson and to some extent Champion of Glory. And there's plenty of other usages. And sometimes also nice, like on turn 3, dropping a champion with charge, having like Pummel or Torch as backup or Permafrost, just having enough cheap ways to fill out your curve on 2 and 3 while you drop a 1 or 2 drop, for example, or even on 4 when you drop something else. It's just so good to have enough cheap. Um, cheap solutions for problems that keep letting you attack. Um, and while this card is no finest hour, and maybe not even a fine hour, just an okay hour, it's still kind of necessary, I think. 2-3 two to three should probably be in every deck at this point because of Cathans and similar issues. And it still synergizes pretty well with the quick draw units and with Warcry and stuff, or with the weapons like a weapon plus pummel suddenly gets through a titan and so on. That's the other thing, like you need ways to get through titan and all your stuff usually mostly gets to like 4 or 5 attack and then a pummel does the rest and allows you to keep pushing into a titan. That's the other reason why I found pummel necessary. Basically the endurance units that you can't permafrost, so to speak, that have higher health and are really annoying. Next we have rock slide. Another really sweet card. This card ranges from very underwhelming to great, since if you get to kill two things or like kill a thing and uh, pop an Aegis, this card is great. But if you just kill a kill a one health unit and ping one to the face or kill like a one or two drop by dealing two damage, uh, then this card is pretty underwhelming because it's not very tempo efficient. But it is a nice tool to have, can make blocks really awkward for the opponent, especially with your quick draw units. I had spots where I traded like a one drop and half a rock slide against one unit and pinged off another unit that was blocking my outlaw or whatever. And then you're getting some pretty good value. Um, depending on the meta game, I can even see three or four of these. Like if there's a lot of um, one health stuff, like go wide, Praxis tokens, Jitterless. Callus, and so on. Maybe Shimmer Pack. All these decks with a lot of like X ones um, that can be annoying, or like Dimbira if they run more of a like grenade and drone type build, and um, then I can easily see going up to three or four. Right now, I'm pretty happy with two. It's also like a matter of space. Like basically, there has to be less need for Pummel, I think in order to be able to afford more rock slides, most likely. And last but not least, we have Morningstar. This card will raise quite a bunch of eyebrows, <coughs> but um, I found this fairly necessary and pretty good. So let me explain. First of all, this deck is sort of a more aggressive, low to the ground version of Rakano at this point. We have similar amounts of Warcry and Rakano. Like Rakano usually doesn't run Watch Paladin anymore, so they also only have Oni and Outlaw. 
and then they often have Scepter as like their third Warcry card. And they often even don't run four Scepters. So this deck basically has a Warcry card more than most Rakano lists these days. Aside from Hammer of Might, which is sort of Warcry. I mean, it is Warcry, but it's like a one-shot deal. It's kind of more of a summon trigger than reliable Warcry. So this deck Warcry um, trains about as well as Rakano does. If not slightly better, especially because it's like a little lower to the ground and a bit better at like gaining momentum in the board, I would say. And um, this would like already like only one Warcry trigger means that every unit in this deck can at least trade with a Titan or attack into a Titan without trading, which is very, very important because Titan is the big enemy of this deck. And we have to make sure that we can reasonably often win through a Titan. The other thing is the Overwhelm is not irrelevant, thanks to all the Warcry that I mentioned. Units can be pretty big, so giving them Overwhelm, like giving a Vadius that got a couple of Warcry triggers, Overwhelm is really strong and makes him really obnoxious because once this guy is like 7 or 8 attack, Overwhelm, Warcry, Aegis, quick draw, the game is going out of hand for the opponent because there's not much that stops him other than like double removal if the opponent has it. And I tried other cards, I tried Steerfunk Chakram, which is sort of appealing, it's like a bit better with the quick draw units in a way, because um, first of all it comes back if they get rid of your unit, second of all it immediately uh, beats Titan on any unit in the deck, and particularly well on the two quick draw units. The problem is though that it doesn't give health, which makes it uh, much, much worse in situations where you're facing smaller units, because then you just like put that chakram on like an Oni Ronin and they just trade with a small unit anyway and you're not gaining anything. And yeah, in general, like the extra health from Morningstar just makes the weapon better at everything else that isn't dealing with Titan. And I think the card is still good enough at dealing with Titan between Warcry triggers, Pummel, the burn spells to help additional weapons in Scepter and just values that straight up um, beats Titan with a Morningstar and this is like the preferred Morningstar target anyway. But even if you don't have a Vadius, Morningstar is still good enough usually in uh, helping deal with the Titan. And also makes it harder for opponents to like jump block and races and survive. And yeah, overall I just found Morningstar to uh, look and feel and so far perform much better uh, than the Chakram. I have like 10 games with the Morningstar now and before I had like 10 with Chakram. And yeah, the deck just needed um, a little curve topper since with, with 25 power you still are pretty likely to hit your force power so it doesn't hurt to have like a few four cost cards. I probably wouldn't want four in 25 power because 25 power is not um, reliably four power but uh, reasonably enough. So two to three four drops seems like a fine number. Currently I, I'm running three and the idea basically behind Morningstar was also that in Rakano, um, Hammer of Might is a very integral part of the deck's offensive momentum and allowing the deck to be able to keep attacking. And even though Morningstar doesn't have the powerful Warcry 3 of Hammer, it has everything else and even gives you the added, added overwhelm which sometimes matters. Uh, making the card on board have the same impact or slightly more impact than Hammer of Might just not generating the the additional uh, postponed value of Hammer which is fine since this deck needs it less. It's so aggressive and hits so hard that it isn't that big of a deal that you're not getting the Warcry 3 in a lot of games. Sometimes it will be but we don't have access to Hammer of Might so we gotta gotta go with what we have and Morningstar is what we have and it does the job pretty well. Like the deck um, it's it's the kind of the the drop the last drop that brings the opponent to crumb 
to crumble often. Like they are about to stabilize with like some higher health units and then you just drop Morningstar on your best attacker and shove again and then they potentially already have to jump block with their bigger health unit because they are too low in health which allows your smaller units to also attack and so on and then they just with the back against the wall and if you have some Aegis units sweepers also won't save them and they are just between a rock and a hard place and just dying. And yeah, Morningstar has been doing that pretty well. Like I said, I'm not 100% sure if 3 is the right number. Maybe 2 is good enough, but currently I want 3 to um, have it often enough and also test it more to see it more often to get a better feel for how it performs. And so far I have been pretty happy and impressed with Morningstar, I gotta say. And yeah, um, in the last 10 games that I played with Morningstar, I went 9 and 1 to give you an idea. I lost a single game. I think in the mirror against the go wide version where I was outdrawn, like rapid stack with assembly line and grenade and drone, which is really good in the mirror. And uh, especially if they have a bit better draw than you, you can beat them, but you need a good draw yourself. To, your draw needs to probably be as good as theirs or better most of the time to beat them. And Morningstar is also actually pretty good at beating them because it allows you to give get a better attack into their tokens and stuff. Like, have a bunch of smaller units, hold down their tokens and then put Morningstar on one and keep attacking. But yeah, I didn't get in that scenario and eventually um, got flooded by their tokens. That's the only game I lost in the last 10 games. Alright, the power base is just 25 power, very light on primal. That's part of why I don't play um, um, Cloud Snake ha uh, Harrier. Since the double blue on turn 3 has a lot of tension with the double red of these two guys and the double red of Champion on 2 and also the double and triple red of Flail and Blast, the deck just runs a lot smoother with no double blue. Um, also Harrier just doesn't do that much. The flying is kinda nice sometimes, but against the Titan it still doesn't do anything. The ability is less impactful <coughs> than I thought and would have hoped. And also you only want so many 3 drops and deck already has 8 3 cost cards and a couple of 4s and Morningstar is probably just better than a Harrier for example. And these two are definitely better than Harrier. Um, this allows me to only run 4 Primal Sigils, 16 Primal in total which is good enough to uh, have like a 90% chance or something for um, turn 1 Snowcrust Yeti still and enough blue to eventually get to a 4-2 champion. But that's not that important. Like as long as champion has a 3-2 charge, it is already good enough and it is great if it's a 4-2, which happens most of the time still. And yeah, the 9 fire make it really reliable for the fire 1 drops and the double and triple cost cards. And other cards that I considered and that are very reasonable depending on the meta game are Sensari Brigant, another card that I liked better than Harrier in this deck, since it's really great with the Warcry triggers. It's nice with Pummel, both Pummel helping it uh, not die because it's kind of small, so if it gets blocked by, let's say, a Seraph, you can just Pummel to save it. And if it doesn't get blocked, it turns Pummel into like a 1 power deal 4 to the face with uh, a scry one. And it's also a nice target for stuff like Thepter if there's no blocker. And the charge just is really nice for the momentum. It's another immediate impact threat that makes it harder for the opponent to block enough stuff to not take lethal damage over the next couple turns. And it's really good against like relic weapons and sweepers and stuff against control decks. And a card that is a reasonable option in the sideboard if it's not main. I actually had four Sensari Brigand in the main over the Morning Stars and the Pummel, I think, for the most for a long time. The problem is a bit that the three drop slot gets a little gummed up. Um the deck is more vulnerable to Titan with Brigand. And yeah, um so I traded the charge three drop for 
a pseudo charge for drop and an extra pummel to um, still have this like momentum push, this immediate impact charge type effect, but in a way that is better at stall breaking because Brigand is better at beating interaction but not as good at beating blockers at beating stall. And the deck is already quite good against interaction between like Torch against Relic Weapons, Flail against Relic Weapons, and Aegis against Removal and Sweepers, and generally a low curve against Removal that is usually costing the same, around the same or more than my units depending on what they target. Um, yeah, I think there's not many other cards to mention. Obliterate is just clunky, you need like 29 power to reasonably play 3-4 to four Obliterates. Maybe you can get away with 2-3 to three Obliterates and 28 power. The third obliterate is already a bit sketchy, since you kind of need 25 plus probably 4 Caleb's favor to run for obliterate. And obliterate is kind of slow and clunky, and if you uh, are aggressive enough and beat down enough, then uh, you don't need obliterate. Like this deck is a beat down deck, not a burn deck. Like a burn aggressive deck, this is a an on board tempo aggressive deck that uh, just uses cards like Flame Blast as removal and or finisher, <laughs> while Obliterate is just too slow and inflexible and clunky. Sometimes you just can't even play it in the entire game. Mortar is the next thing, like Mortar has a similar role as Morningstar, although I think Morningstar just plays better to the strengths and the momentum of the deck, while Mortar can still sometimes with like the quick draw units finish off like a Titan if they block or a one drop plus a mortar trades with the titan and can sometimes win the game off the top if you're stalled out but it's better to just make sure you don't get stalled out by playing cards like morningstar and pummel than uh, putting in cards for for situations when you're already losing it's better to make sure your deck gets into those situations as little as possible by playing cards that help avoid that and yeah i think that covers all the cards um the the tracker is um, unfortunately also not playable because of the one drops. The card is really nice and really good, but um, first of all, it puts more strain on the primal again, and also um, yeah, doesn't work with the twelve one house one drops. Unfortunately, even though it's a really uh, really good card. And last but not least, we have Sophia Drake. Same with Soulfire Drake. Um, in order to run, say, two Soulfire Drakes, you probably need 27 to 28 power at least. It's kind of nice with the Warcry, but yeah, once again, kind of slow. The deck should stop at like three and a half curve wise to be consistently aggressive and consistently curving out and good at pushing forward rather than being stalled out and hoping Drake gets there, which it often doesn't, because it's getting Desert Marshal, Titaned, Torched, plenty of instant removal to stop it, or just random flyers, Valkyrie and Forces trading with it, and so on. There's just The card is just so unreliable and situational. It's a potentially nice sideboard card if you can raise the power enough to support it against decks like Armory, where it's really scary, but then again, you probably do just fine against them if you're very aggressive and hit hard and fast before their harsh roll and then have like Aegis units against their harsh roll and stuff, so shouldn't be needed. And I think that covers like all the the typical sort of um, Skyclear units. Oh no, I forgot one. Groundbreaker is one other unit, uh, one other card, and one that I considered, and that might be an int that was like. The first thing I considered before the 4-drop weapons. The triple fire is not that big of a deal. It can sometimes be a bit awkward, but usually not. Um, the other thing is, though, the problem is it's very vulnerable to silences. Like, silence is not that great against that deck. So they don't need to aggressively use their silences if they have other stuff to do. And then, like, against some of the Titan decks, especially the Combray based titan decks. They have often like eight silences and now even the like non-green titan decks can have four silences in Archive Curator and then you just drop this like 3-6 double damage 
just for it to be silenced, and then you have this 3 6, which is pretty underwhelming. And you don't even have Morningstar then to put to make it a 6 6 to uh, a 6 9 to attack into Titan and stuff like that. So you need like a scepter with a Warcry trigger or a Warcry trigger on on the Groundbreaker and so on. So right now, I would rather just relic uh, uh, relegate. Um, Groundbreaker to the sideboard, but it's a really nice sideboard card. It's really good in the mirror. It's good against like life force, against like non silence, uh, various like non silence uh, decks or silence light decks. And since spot removal is not that big a deal on uh, Groundbreaker because the deck is so aggressive and has so many units before Groundbreaker that the opponent often has to aggressively use their removal on that. But yeah, silence is a pretty big problem and turning your aggressive 4 drop into a 3 6 is quite crippling, I think. Um, but yeah, Groundbreaker is an interesting alternative, and depend and if you face a lot of, say, life gain, like, I don't know, against Chalice, it can be kinda nice, although they have their Desert Marshals, unfortunately, and Archive Curators, and against, like, um, Xena Life Force, it's an all-star, and turns the matchup from uh, bad into potentially good, because they usually have limited ways of dealing with Groundbreaker. So yeah, um, that covers, I think, all the, now really covers all the cards I think that I'm not playing, that I chose not to run, and why I didn't. And yeah, that's it for the deck list. This was one of the longer deck techs, but there is a lot of options here and a lot of things to explain and choose. Hope you guys enjoyed this um, in-depth rundown. As usual, if you want to support me and my content, check the donation link in the description below and follow me on social media. You can find the social media links on uh, on the screen here or in the description down below as well to stay up to date and don't miss any updates, rules and stuff that I'm occasionally posting there. Uh, yeah, and as usual, I'm going to hop into some games with the deck to show it in action. I'm currently in like top 15 masters drop down to like top 50-ish after like brewing some stuff on stream <clears throat> yesterday and climbed back into like I think rank 14 with this deck to make up for the lost rank. Alright, that's it for the deck tech. Thanks for watching. See you in a moment with the games. Stay tuned.